For 40 years, Cardigan had Britain's biggest jeans factory. They made 35,000 pairs a week. And in 2002, you know, that factory closed. Sick. Sick. I've got to travel four hours a day to have work. Yeah. i got to go. Good luck. When Dewar's factory closed, it was a very sad time. It was like a bereavement. It's a shame Cardigan didn't come to this. Cardigan's going to be absolutely finished, it is. When you suddenly shut those factory gates for 400 people out of a town of 4,000, that rips that community apart. For us at Hyatt, the mission is to go and get 400 good people like Jaws back. You're going to leave us. Life as a student in London. What are you looking forward to the most then? I think it's more exciting than here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it is. The thing about London is though, it's so expensive. Accommodation's more expensive. Going out is more expensive. Staying in is cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, staying in is just as cheap. <laughs> 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 I used to have a car, right, um, when I started my previous first business, and the petrol gauge wouldn't work, so I never knew if I had a full tank or an empty tank. So when I went to the market stalls each day, I made sure that I sold, so I could put petrol in the tank so I could get home. And if there was a day where I didn't sell, I didn't know if I was going to get home or not. I live in Cardigan in West Wales. It's a small town. It's 4,000 people. It's a hard-working town. It's a, an old market town. It's, you know, it's had its boom years and its bust years, and the farming community is very strong. They love endeavor. I mean, they love it when you work hard and you are humble. I mean, and I think they don't like it if you come in and say, I, I am the big I am. That's not this town. We could have chosen many things, but the one thing that my town does better than almost any town in the world is make jeans. We wanted to combine our first two letters of our surname with the first two letters of utility, so it was H-I-U-T, Hyatt. And people go, how do you say it? I'm going, how do you want to say it? You can say Hyatt, 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 who gives a shit? Six years ago when we started, there were five of us, and right now there are about 20 of us. We make 150 pairs a week. I mean, the context for that is, you know, Aston Martin probably make more cars than us a week. So it's a very small amount of jeans. I'm more like building the brand, and Claire is more about running the business side of things. 
I'm a bit more strategic and he's a bit more out there. So he'll go, why don't we do this? And I'll go, yeah, OK, but how are we going to do it? So I kind of work out how it could happen. So we have our moments, but um, we kind of work well together. <laughs> You've got to kind of be really careful. Yeah. And as she keeps reminding me, she has one more share in the company than I do. The metric for business for me is work with the people you want to and look after them. And so you have all those different characters who bring their interests and therefore shape the company. Paul is you know, the person who's in charge of repairing all the jeans. We know that he has you know, a few loves. One of them is surfing. And the deal that we've struck with him is if the surf's good, he doesn't have to come in. It would be more tricky if we lived in Hawaii. <laughs> Andrew's not going to win the award for the happiest human being on the planet. But if you study teams, every great team will have a captain. They won't go to the dinner parties. They're there to make shit happen. And Andrew's that captain. Rob is... I'll tell you a story about Rob. We were going through the first years of growth and struggle, and he kept phoning up and said, like, you know, have you got any work? Have you got any work? So when we got him in, it was like a great thing. It taught me the skills for me to be here for the last five and a half years, and it pays the mortgage for you to have a family, to have your home. It's really exciting to be able to work for a company like this because you're doing something that everybody that works here cares about. In this area, a lot of young people have tended to move away from here because they haven't found the opportunities that they wanted. So I think the Hyatts are really helping in Cardigan. I thought I'd have to move to London or to San Fran to find a company that thinks this way, to get that creative output. Because in Wales, it's not really a thing. But funny enough, now we get everyone from London coming to us to ask us for advice. <laughs> I've been making jeans since I'm 15. In the Hyatt factories, we do everything by hand. So that's more satisfaction at the end of the process where you can look at a pair of jeans and you've done it all and you're proud of what you've done. For Grandmaster Ellen, she's not very tall, but she's like the most powerful person I've ever met. I mean, she runs the factory. Malcolm Gladwell wrote in one of his books that it takes 10,000 hours to be a Grandmaster at chess. Cloud has probably done 50,000 hours of learning to cut jeans. He's beyond a grandmaster. The reason I call them grandmasters is I actually want to celebrate them as makers. And so I thought it was really important that we understood that these people are everything to this company. The way we made jeans, what GWS and I first started, you had a row of 30 or 40 machinists. Each machinist would just do one operation of the gene, and the next step would be the next operation, and so on and so on. The difference is with Hyatt, the grandmasters, as they call now, make the complete garment from start to finish. I left school a shy, innocent 15-year-old, uh, coming into a factory. Then I was made redundant after 38 years. Of all four closures, the town of Cardigan is probably least equipped to cope. It'll double the jobless rate, and with nothing but economic decline on show, it'll be a massive task to find alternatives. In such a difficult employment market, it's hard to see where these 435 workers will go. A sad day, it's like a family breaking up. So I'm nearly in tears now, I've been seeing a friend, goodbye to friends. We are standing in the old Dewhurst factory where I first started um, 50 years ago. And I came in with the intention of maybe only staying here for a couple of years, but uh, ended up 38 years. I 
I knew Dugas was going to close probably nine months before it did. I had to take the jobs of people I'd worked with for 25, 30 years. It's the only time I've been in the ladies' toilets. So knowing that was difficult because I couldn't say anything at the time, but that's th what the job was. Yeah. And when they did close the factory, it was quite hard to see your colleagues you know, become out unemployed. Four hundred people losing jobs was immense. At the time, you saw less people in towns. The shops were less busy because there was no wages coming in. Some people left the area because it's a holiday farming community. There's no industries apart from Dewis at the time. So it was quite daunting when people were made redundant to find work. Cardigan making jeans was something I'd never th think I'd ever see again. So when David said he wanted to start his own jeans company in Cardigan, uh, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Everybody knows, like, if you lose your job as a human being, that has an impact. But, like, when a town loses its major, you know, biggest you know, employer, that has an impact too, not just in terms of economics, but, like, mojo. Like, towns have mojos too. And so, like, you have this family that is not your family, but it's your work family. And so businesses have great responsibility. You know, they are little mini communities, aren't they? Claudio's 65, he has no plans to retire, but there's a lot of candles on the birthday cake. And so there'll come a time where he'll want to put his cutting knife down and go and have an easier life. The important thing is for these grandmasters is to pass the baton on, to pass the skill set on. Future is female. So one more exam to go. Physics. Is that the one you're the genius in? Or? <laughs> Just checking. I was quite confident in it. And then, like, the revision session today, I just realised I didn't really know much. So now you go do more work. Maybe that's the plan. Yeah. Remember that time when you were in school and you said to someone, <laughs> What catalogue <laughs> company does your dad have? Because <laughs> you thought all well, dads did the same thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> How old was I when you sold Howie's? Um, when did we sell it? 11 years ago. So I was seven. Myself and Claire ran a previous business called Howie's. You know, we started it in uh, 95. Do you remember it? <clears throat> yeah. When we were walking up those stairs, we remembered the sound that it made. Yeah. We'd never really run a business before. We were two copywriters working in advertising, and actually, to be honest, like we knew shit about running business. And we got ourselves in trouble because it was growing so fast. And we, we thought growth was good. Yeah, and we were there going, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great. Actually, it was killing us. And so we had to go and get a bunch of money because we were growing so fast because we needed more money to help with the growth. Suddenly your independence gets shattered. And so we ended up selling it. Do you regret it? Or do you think no, you made the right No, because we're doing it higher. Yeah. The worst of times gives you the best of yeah. times. So you have to go through that. It felt oh. weird for sure. Like I could, I, I didn't really know what was going on, but I could feel that it was mm. like not right. You gotta be really careful as an entrepreneur. Like, you crave this thing called growth. I like chocolate. 
we crave more chocolate. And then sometimes we go and binge on chocolate and we don't feel so good. Um, and growth can really help a business, but it also can kill it. It was a hard lesson. But if we had done those things with Howie's, I don't know if we'd be good enough to go and do this thing. A second chance, then? Yeah. You know, not, you know, I mean, I'm proud of Howie's, so... I was beaten up after Howie's. It was bittersweet. I was, like, at a low point. And um, I'll be honest, I didn't want to run around the same track twice. If we were really old, it's either we sell it or you take it on, yeah, would you it. work <laughs> in Hyatt Denim one day, then? Maybe after I've done something myself. Yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't want it to just die out and someone else have it. I wouldn't work there full time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd hire someone <laughs> to run it. No, I, I, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everyone starts getting really big. Yeah. Now, when people go, oh, we want to give you lots of money, invest in your company, I'm going, fuck you, I don't want any money. I have the internet. Yeah. The internet for the maker is the holy grail. Wi Fi you know, broadband, all those things. They are literally roads in the sky. And so the makers now can travel on those roads because the roads weren't there before. We were always locked out. Oh, you could only win if you had the biggest budget. You could only win if you had the biggest brand. You could only win if you had more money than anyone else. No, that shit doesn't apply. It's like, who can tell the best story wins? Who can make the best product wins? And so I spent all my marketing money on the coffee machine, and it doesn't actually matter. Even if it means us saying no to some good things, I think, you know, we've got to manage this for the next 10, 20 years, not, not for the next 10 months. We want to build a strong company, and, yeah, it takes time to do that. We got a call uh, breakfast on a Friday, and it was actually Hugh here saying, we just got a call from Kensington Palace. And they wanted us to send some jeans to them. And the extraordinary thing is, it was her day off, and Ellen walked in to like pick something up. And we said, Ellen, can you actually make these jeans for us? And she made them. We knew signing that NDA, non-disclosure agreement, meant something interesting is about to happen because they want you to obviously honor your word and not tell anybody about it. Claire took him up to the post office. And in the post office, they said like, oh, there's no number on, the, on this address. And they looked at it and went, oh, okay, it's Kensington Palace, doesn't need a number. For a couple of weeks, we didn't hear anything until the Daily Telegraph, which is one of our leading newspapers, you know, phoned us up and said, can you confirm Meghan Markle is wearing your jeans? And you go, oh, wow, OK. Everyone is talking about the royal wedding, but today we are seeing how Meghan Markle's style is helping a small clothing company. A tiny Welsh denim company has been swamped by orders from all around the world after the princess was captured wearing their jeans at a public event. The orders went crazy. They kept coming and they kept coming and they kept coming. Suddenly, you have three months' worth of orders in a night. At first, we thought, oh, you know, OK, we sold a few jeans because of it. But the back order list just grew and grew and grew. OK, all right, so you think you're going to need to go for a smaller size? For a small company, you dream about that moment where nobody knows you and then all of a sudden you get worldwide attention. It also puts a lot of stress on the company because factories don't like spikes. When you're running that company, you see the internal stress of trying to get your customers their orders as quickly as you can. I think in this Amazon Prime world, like people expect everything tomorrow. And, and suddenly we're telling people, going, you're going to have to wait three months for your jeans. No, I think there's a, like, there's a real danger 
That's not the experience that we truly want to give to people. There is a danger to us. When I look at 40 to 45% growth, I can manage that. When it suddenly becomes 200, 300% growth, that's a lot of pressure on a business. Can we catch up in the current factory? No. Like, point blank, we just can't get enough people in our factory to sit down with the machines. And so, the, you know, the problem is real. We have to move to bigger building. We don't really want to get too big too fast because we want to be able to keep everybody employed. And we learned that from Howie's. For myself and Claire, it's not just about, oh, let's go and grow a company, let's sell it, we'll have a few million quid. The purpose of Hyatt Denim is to go and put that engine back into the town and get its mojo back and actually give it a reason to exist, right? Not just as a tourist town. So there's a lot of pressure on us to do things, to think about things, not just about ourselves, but as the town as well, in order for us to complete the mission this time. You, know, you can only complete the mission as if you stay in business. But do you know what? These people are world-class at what they do, and suddenly people are taking them seriously. Yeah, they're fucking good at what they do, and let's celebrate it. Too much growth kills you. No growth also kills you. This is the old factory, which is going to be our new factory. So the grandmasters are literally coming back to where they used to sew. For Claudio and Ellen, they feel energized by it. This is unfinished business. Even though there are risks of growing perhaps maybe a little bit faster than we'd like right now, but you know you have to be brave as well. And so we have to move forward. So let's move and let's move quick. To manage all this process is Andrew's job. There's a huge amount of complexity, but Andrew is the military precision that brings all that stuff together. Yeah, so I've got a plan for the machines. So basically, from, from here, down that line, that's the service line. You know, that's, that's the double suppressing, so and the service lines are on this, yeah? And then that line there is one team's worth of machines. Yep, so it's going to be set up like that. And then that one over there mirrors exactly the same. Okay. So where this tracking all finishes here, that's where those machines stop. Originally, we had stuff moving in this period. Yep. Yeah. However, I was looking at seeing whether we can move some stuff here, which I think we're tight to try and move that next week. Yeah. Yep. So what happens then so if we get late? At the moment, the team makes 180 pairs in the week. Yeah. The issue that we've got is that one team won't finish. That work is going to get drop into that week, which effectively, for those two weeks, we're only making 180. Okay. So we're 180 we're short. Week's... So we're losing a week's worth of production. That's a big chunk. Of... Well, it's a big chunk, so it affects us financially. Yeah. Turnover-wise, it's losing 15, 20 k's worth of stock. OK. Over here How much well. time do you physically need to move production? I think it's a two to three day process. And then to we move machines, yep. work. Mm -hmm. We could do it in a day if we wanted to do it in one big long day. There's nothing stopping us doing that, is there? Moving in in a day? We can do. So we could, we could do production. Right up to Thursday. And production. finish on Thursday night and then move on the Friday, Saturday. Sunday. I think we'll start moving some machines. We can move some lighter machines out on the Thursday. That means that we'd gain that week and a half. And in theory, we won't lose production. Theory. I know. They look 
so I know. <laughs> oh my god. It's good, isn't it? That's amazing. <laughs> Proud? Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. I know. I know. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Oh my god, we're gonna have to fill it. Will you take um, a photo of me and Dad in front of that poster? Yeah. Thing. Look, look in, look in. Feels kind of grown up, doesn't it? Yeah. You've got to go and take on some of the best brands in the world. You go, okay. Let's do it from here. Dear Internet. We make jeans. <laughs> Can we maintain the spirit and the soul of the company as we grow? I think that's such a great question. That is a question that all entrepreneurs should be asking themselves. You know, does scaling this business mean that we lose the soul? Um, I don't know if it has to be that way. I think it can be the opposite of that. One come flying off around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Go around. Go around the roundabout. Oh, Ooh. you've got something to tie them on. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Claire, we have a life together, we have a family together, we run businesses together, and um, I mean, sometimes you don't exchange words, you just exchange a view and like a glance, and that can say everything that you want to say. The mission is to go and get all those jobs back in Cardigan. This time, we're going to complete the mission. Is that right? Yeah, right, that's right. When you put your name to something, it's because of pride. What was it like to see the first pair made in the big new factory? Um, like life is a series of defining moments, and and that moment was the start of the next journey. I think we have to just stick to doing one thing remarkably well we're going to be absolutely fine because those grandmasters, they make one of the best jeans in the world. All we have to do is tell that story. <laughs> <laughs>